Thanks for tuning into our message at Coastal Christian Ocean City. For more information on anything going on here, you can visit our website at ccoceancity.com or check out our app in the App Store or Google Play. Today, Pastor Matthew will be bringing the message. So without further ado, here's Pastor Matthew. The book of 1 John, chapter 2. It is a necessary guide for those who say they love him, to look like him. We are reflections, a mirror of Christ. And just as Christ was, we too are called to be in the world, but not of the world. For if anyone loves this world, then they cannot love the Father, because in the darkness of this world, true light is already shining. God is light, and if we know God, then we must walk in the light and keep his commandments. But there is a strange beauty to it, and the beauty is that we cannot do it on our own. Eventually, no matter how hard we try, we all will sin, and we all fall short. But we have an advocate. His name is Jesus Christ. He is our Savior and the propitiation for our sins. Not only for our sins, but for the sins of the entire world. So we are back in the book of First John, if you heard anything in that preview video, kind of a great synopsis over the entire book of First John. It's hard for a teacher of the word to really track common threads each week in the book of First John. He is so random and sporadic. He jumps around from theme to theme. He's using light and darkness. He runs into hate and contrasts it with love. He's bringing absolute truth to the surface. And one thing he does not shy away from is calling out error. And that's crucial for a Christian to be able to discern the difference between good and evil in a world that actually calls that which is good and upright evil, and that which is evil they call good. Do you know the difference between absolute truth and absolute error? John is going to labor, speaking to the general church in a general epistle, reminding them that this God that he experienced in Christ, remember the very first chapter, his preface, he introduces the assembly to a relationship that's intimate that he had with Jesus. Remember, he said, I heard him, I saw him, I touched him, I witnessed him, the word of life made flesh. And then if he has it on the edge of your seat, you go, I want that. And he goes, you can have that fellowship too. And he introduces the church at large, which is this church, to an authentic and intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And he provides litmus tests for us to leave and not know whether or not we know him. That's the greatest danger. The greatest ignorance, I'll actually say, is for you not to look into your eternal residence. We're going to cover some very serious verses going to present before you the brevity of life, how 10 out of 10 people die. That's a reality for you not to consider where you will land beyond this temporal life is a foolish matter. And too many of us have been to funerals and the difference between a believer and we know where they're at. We mourn them. We miss them. We cry for them. We long to be with them. But I said as a reality check two weeks ago, they're not missing us because they're with Jesus. And then the other side, funerals where the individual who passed did not know the Lord. And no matter how many flowers we line the stage with, no matter how many people come forward, grab the mic, and speak a kind word on behalf of that individual, if they did not know Christ, the reality is that they're in a place called hell. And for some reason, the church in America is hesitant to say that word. So you need to consider, where do you stand before God? Who do you say that Jesus is? That's the most important question. So we do a quick review. John is constantly laboring to get the true believers to rise to the surface and calling out those that claimed Christ by name but did not live Christ by nature Eventually, here's what happens. A healthy church body exposes unhealthy bodies in the church. Let me say that again. A healthy church body, from the pr production of worship 
in spirit and in truth from the administration of God's word, verse by verse. God, what do you have for us today? A healthy church body will expose unhealthy bodies in the church. That's why people leave. But for an individual to leave a Bible-preaching, Bible-believing church would have us question, where were they at in the first place? So we consider last time we were together, John presents to us the sinfulness of worldliness. So through verses 15 to 17, a quick review. Do not love the world or the things in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that is not of the Father, that is of the world. And then he kind of says that the things in the world, they're passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Translation, the worldly man dies forever. The godly man abides forever. So with the consumption of what we see with our eyes, what we desire with our flesh, and of course, this arrogant spirit that we can have based on where we're at in life and what we have in spite of you, God, these are the things of the world. This is what the enemy uses to actually get the believer to completely forget or forsake their conviction. If he can preoccupy us with the things of the world, the glamours, the glitter, the things I want, if he can get me to stop focusing on eternity and pursue the things that are temporary, oh, you might land in eternity with Jesus because you are born again, but what he stole from you here and now, what you're supposed to do on earth, with the gift God gave you to glorify him. But how about the illusion that non-believers are under? Thinking that the pursuit of the things in the world, riches, possessions, material gain, oh, that's what this life is all about. Get as much as you can, as fast as you can get it. Climb the corporate ladder as high as you can go. And what we do is we see that and we affirm it and say, I wanna be like that. I wanna pursue that type of occupation too the clothes, the money, the cars, the houses, all that is in the world, all that I see with my eyes and I want, all that I crave with my flesh because it's sinful, all that I feel in my heart at times when I neglect and forget God, how good he is, that is not of God, that is not of the Father. And ultimately, those who are consumed with the temporary lust of this life will eventually be eternally lost in the next life. Jesus spoke a parable. In fact, after a certain point in the Gospels, as he is going towards the cross, he unleashes a series of end-time teachings that we must consider as a church. I'm going to pull out of Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. Here is kind of the context. It says, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, worldly, also heard all these things that Jesus said, and they ridiculed him. And then Jesus tells this parable. It's only found in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen. Talked about what he wore. He fared sumptuously, that's luxuriously, every day. He had a lot. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Here's the contrast. Full of sores. How about that for clothing? Who was laid at the rich man's gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Here's the picture painted. Jesus tells a story, talks about a rich man who has no name. And then he ident identifies a poor man who has a name. Interestingly, here they have completely different circumstances. One fares sumptuously, has all he could possibly imagine in this life. The other has nothing. Yet, the Bible says in Proverbs, here's the common denominator between the rich and the poor. Both have to respond to a creator. In other words, both will eventually die. Because that's the next verse, verse 22. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. This was a Jewish saying about the afterlife, Abraham's bosom, as if there were two compartments in the afterlife. One was the place of 
previous uh, pre-judgment. The other was the place of paradise. Abraham's bosom was for those who believed in the God of Israel. They both die, and here's what happens with the rich man. The rich man dies and was buried. He had a memorial. He had a funeral service. You better believe the entire community responded. You better believe there was a line out the door to get into that church service to pay their final dues. And of course, this is what Jesus says happens while that's taking place and being in torments in Hades. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. The first time he actually looks afar off, this rich man, it's too late. He sees Lazarus and he cries and says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. How desperate must one be in a position of torment to simply desire just a tip of water on somebody's finger? That's it. That's all he wants. That's how bad it was. So that he may cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham's son, remember, in your lifetime you received your good things, likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. Besides, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here cannot, nor can those from here pass to you. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. Are you catching the irony here? The very individual that he would step over every single day as he went on his way to get out of his gate is now the individual he's asking to be sent to his family. The person he neglected, his sin wasn't that he hated Lazarus. His sin was that he neglected somebody in need. Sidebar, because those who are the called, those who have Christ in them, cannot neglect people's needs. When we see needs, we have this unction to want to meet the need. It's called compassion. Compassion is your need or your pain in my heart. That's a litmus test to know whether or not Christ has a hold of your life, whether or not you feel the needs and the pains of other people. Here's the next request. I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. This is the word of God. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. In other words, they had the prophets, they have the scriptures. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Here's a subtle prophetic word from Jesus pointing to himself. It's an illusion of his very own resurrection. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And in that saying, Jesus was pointed to himself. That won't convince them if somebody came back from the dead. What is going on here? Well, the rich man in his life had everything he needed. And in this temporal earth, this world was his heaven. But because he didn't make a decision to choose the only way to heaven, true heaven, which is Christ, his eternity would be his hell. The poor man, oh, this world was his hell. Some of you are going through some circumstances. You keep saying, why do I keep going through hell on earth? And God says, just hold on. Be eagerly waiting for my return. I know it's hell right now, but the hell's fire is refining your character, which is eternal. You need to pass through your trial so that my son Jesus' image could be formed, fashioned inside of you. And you might not see it now, but eventually it will all in hindsight make total eternal sense. And the poor man's temporary circumstances, hellish. Yet the parable tells us he would have eternal comfort. His eternity would be heaven. So with this picture painted, again, I ask, where do you stand with Christ? How are you living in light of eternity? Or if I reframe the question, are you living in the light of eternity? Are you living governed by the economy of eternity? Is every day, which is made up of seconds, minutes, and hours, is every breath we breathe 
Is it for God's glory? This is the air I breathe. It's his breath in our lungs. Am I giving God back what he gave me? Moses would write in Psalm 91, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Now, when Moses writes this, and as we read this, he is not asking us to consider the longevity of our lives. Teach us to number our days. How many calendar years will I actually live on earth? We don't know. He's not talking about longevity. He's talking about consider the brevity. And each day with the brevity of life, he's asking you to consider how are you spending your days in light of eternity? Is there a sense of urgency? Sadly, the only time there's ever a sense of urgency is when we are where? At a funeral. Ecclesiastes says, it is better to be in the house of mourning than in the house of feasting. Do you believe that? I don't know about you, but when I'm at a funeral, I'm more introspective. I consider the brevity of life, the shortness of it. It's in the house of mourning where I'm supposed to elevate my perspective back to the things of God. More so than when I'm in the house of feasting, when it's a lot of laughter, and that's good, and that's great, and that's grand. God gave us that as a gift to enjoy life, but life is more than eat, drink, and be merry, because a man, according to another parable that Jesus said, he lived that way. He had so much that he decided to build bigger barns, bigger bank accounts to store up more goods, more material things. He made more money, more investments, and one day, hear what happens, because 10 out of 10 people will die full. Your soul is required of you. What are you going to do now with all those goods? What is the heart of wisdom? The heart of wisdom is to consider where we're at in life in light of our creator. Here's another Ecclesiastes, a couple verses later. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 4. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of amusement. I, I love that because... It dovetails with Psalm 90, 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And the heart of wisdom is in the house of mourning. What's that got to do with the house of God? Well, this is supposed to be a place where we come together as broken people. We do not have it all together. Don't ever put me on a pedestal because I stand on a stage. Broken, fragile, frail, I fail. Desperate need of a savior. The difference when I make a mistake, I own it and I go right back at the cross. Oh, you do not need to remind me when I make a mistake. I am my worst critic. But I've been through so much that I know the first place I go is back to that cross where mercies are brand new. More so than in the house of mirth, the house of amusement. So what's this got to do with 1 John? Everything. We've covered the sinfulness of worldliness. Now, John, again, like I said, he's about to change directions. In verse 18, he introduces us to, ready, the deception of religion. These are verses that get passed over in most churches. What do you do with the Antichrist? Hey, church, look at me. He shows up in verse 18, so we're going to talk about it. Verse 18 reads, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. Okay, so we stop and we consider he addresses the early church as little children. We already talked about he's in his 80s. He's an elder. He addresses them with a term of affection, but he reminds them of the brevity of life. It is the last hour. What is the last hour? It's the end days. When Jesus ascended after his resurrection, he said, I'll be back. Before Arnold Schwarzenegger coined that phrase, Jesus said it. He said, I will be back for what is mine. I'm, just, I'm going for a moment to prepare what? A place, my father's house. What was he doing? Elevating his disciples' perspective back to the things of eternity. It's better that I go, because if I did not go, I could not leave with you the comforter the spirit of truth, my Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does what? Convicts, comforts, counsels. Always brings my attention back to Jesus. Always glorifies God. Always elevates my perspective back 
to the things of eternity. It is the last hour. Jesus spoke another parable, Matthew 25. If we were to go there together, I'm going to paraphrase most of the parable, but it begins like this. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Here's the context. In Jewish culture, they knew when the day of the wedding was, but they did not know the moment or the hour by which the bridegroom would come scoop up his bride. So they knew to plan for the day, but they didn't know the hour, which means it could have been in the morning, it could have been in the afternoon, it could have been late at night. So they're supposed to be ready. That's the context, be ready. Now here's 10 virgins, all invited to the wedding. What are we getting at with this? They're all under the persuasion of God. They all know about God. They all are primed and prepared to understand the scriptures. This is not to the non-believing world. Jesus tells the parable to the believing world or those who are under this deception of religion versus those who are under the devotion of relation. That's really what it boils down to. He is not calling out the non-believer in this parable. He is calling out those who know about the wedding I said recently, 70% of America claims Christianity? And we, in a, a global scale, the other countries look at us and say, are you kidding me? You kill your own children. 70% claim Christ? What are we missing when we say we're the church? This is who he's talking to. This is who John's addressing. See, true believers rise to the surface and those that are uncomfortable, that are offended, those are the ones that usually fall away, proving that they were never gods in the first place. Jesus continues the parable. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. Five of them wise, five of them foolish. What made them wise? They had oil for their lamps. What made them foolish? They did not bring oil. Two camps, those under the deception of religion, as already covered, those under the devotion of relation. Two camps, God is not talking to the rebellious humanity here. He's talking to religious humanity here. Here's how it unfolds. They all go to sleep. So it's not about that. It's not about slumbering. They're all sleeping. And then at midnight, a cry goes out. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Then those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps. Yet the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise said, no, lest there should not be enough for us. You go rather to those who sell and buy your own. Yet while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. Afterward, the virgins came saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he said to them, assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour which the Son of Man is coming. Oil, symbolically, all through Scripture, deals with the Holy Spirit. This is what separated those who know the Word of God up here from those who know the Word of God in here. This was the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. You are supposed to be the ruler of Israel, yet you're considering the things I'm saying and they're baffling you. Don't you know the only way to see heaven, the only way to have understanding of the things of God is that you're born again, that your dead spirit is revived or a theological word, regenerated when the Holy Spirit enters your life. It's not because of anything you could do. It's not because of any good works you could actually muster up. It's a work of God. All it is, is a grace given to us that we receive and revival in the soul. And my spiritual man or my spiritual woman begins to actually leave, live, and I begin to actually breathe. <sighs> Living off of eternity. That's what Jesus meant when he said, I come to give you life and life abundant. Life on top of life. Heaven on top of earth. The enemy, however, he's come to do what? Steal, kill, destroy. The complete antithesis to what Christ stands for. The deception of religion is what John is addressing. The greatest lie that the enemy has is not that there's no God. People know innately there's a God. Even the demons 
believe. <laughs> the greatest lie is not that there's no heaven or hell. We instinctively know that people deserve punishment. That's why we have a prison system, church. It's called retribution. It's why we have laws. The greatest lie is that we think there's no rush, no hurry. Take your time. Young ones, YOLO, you only live once. Have fun. Truth is relative. Nothing matters. Life has no value. Do whatever you want. Try whatever you want. And the enemy says, no rush, no hurry. And the danger is when we're not longing for heaven, we are not living for heaven. When we are not longing for Jesus Christ, we are not living for Jesus Christ. And complacency replaces conviction when heaven seems too distant. Does heaven seem too distant to you tonight? That's because you're not drawing near to God. James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The cure for worldliness is humility before God. The reason why I feel like heaven is so far off is because I am not drawing near. And one thing God cannot do is not draw near to the individual that draws near to him. He has to respond to his promises. He has to respond to his word. When we take a step toward God, he takes an equal step toward us. You want more of God, then you begin running toward God and he will begin running towards you. And when you get to him, you cannot do anything but taste and see that he is good. That's relationship, which is completely different than religion. The deception of religion, which because we come to church does not mean we've come to Christ. Just because we carry the word of God in our hand does not mean we've allowed the word of God to carry us. Just because I have letters at the end of my name and you call me doctor does not mean I have word of God in my heart. You can be an inch away from scripture and still be a mile away from the savior. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the antichrist is coming. Even now, many antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. The antichrist is an actual figure. Daniel prophesied about him. He's called the horn, the little horn. He's actually called the beast in Revelation. John identifies that there will be a figure or a system. And in case we get real weirded out with mysticism when I'm talking about the Antichrist, we could simply look at our own culture in America and see how certain personalities that are celebrities, they create such a frenzy, a following. And we're saying that's not possible. Consider Mao, consider Stalin, consider Hitler. How when a government got behind these individuals, these dictators, what were they able to do for evil's sake? Oh, but the Antichrist will be charming. He'll be deceptive. People will follow him and he will get the people to rebel against God. We have not seen anything yet, but the spirit of the Antichrist, it says is right here, is actually unleashed already. John says, by this we know it is the last hour. In other words, do not sit back. Don't sit on your hands. Get on the edge of your seat. Get in the game. What are you waiting for? He identifies the, the Antichrist in 1 John 2, 22, 1 John 4, 3, 2 John 1, 7, all of which give an identifier of what the spirit of Antichrist is. Anyone who says that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, anyone who denies the Father and the Son, anybody who says God is not a father and he did not have a son and Jesus is not the Son of God, anybody that denies God, let me clue you in onto who that is. That is world religions that take Jesus and either say he was just a prophet, just a good teacher, just a created being, the Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists. If you don't know that, those are the very subtle deceptions of religion that need to be called out according to the word of God. The spirit of antichrist is a counterfeit. The word antichrist does not just mean against. That'd be too easy to point out. The word anti here means in place of, instead of. In other words, it's a counterfeit Christ. It's a religion that's built on Jesus Christ and good works. Jesus Christ and this tradition. Jesus Christ and, by the way, you gotta take this class. 
Jesus Christ and this is the spirit of antichrist, the replacement of what Jesus did. Why is it a counterfeit? Because a counterfeit looks exactly like the authentic thing. It's hard to spot. The only way you could spot it is if you're in the word of God. Discernment in the word of God allows you to identify that which is false. This is how they train the ABA, the American Banking Association. You heard this before. I think it's so appropriate. They train them to spot counterfeits by not giving them counterfeits. They give them the real money. And all they do over the weekend is count real money, smell real money, get acquainted with the real thing. They study the authentic mint. So they know it so well that when they're counting money, they could spot a counterfeit. Do you know God's word so well, inside and out, the truth of God's word, that when a counterfeit comes across, you can spot it? Oh, I can. I can spot a counterfeit. Something inside my spirit rises up in any conversation. I'm in religious circles all the time, and something just rises up. Oh, that didn't sound right. Oh, that sounded off. That's not scriptural. That, that's not in the Bible. Where'd they get that? It's opposing or replacing Christ. Jesus said before he ascended, Jesus said to his disciples, take heed that no one deceives you. There's the word. For many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and will deceive. How many times did he say the word deceive? He then would say in verse 11, many false prophets will rise up and deceive. Here we go. Those that gravitate towards false teachers are those who do not know the scriptures. Those who find themselves pulled to false teachers, false religions, I don't care if they call themselves a Christian church, they gravitate towards those individuals. You can have a Bible on stage, but if that pastor is not teaching the Bible, oh, they might bring up the name of Jesus at a, as a point of reference, but no way, he's never a point of reverence. The Holy One of God. He's just a good moral example. They diminish. They reduce. They do three marks that I'm going to give you tonight. They, first and foremost, dethrone God's word. Any ministry, any religion, any church that dethrones God's word is a false religion. What do I mean by the dethroning God's word? God's word is no longer the authority on every issue of life. We've now left it up to man to make certain determinations about marriage, about gender, about what's acceptable, about life. Remember, I said it, I'm gonna say it again, under the banner that it's a woman's body. Let me, let me clue you in. Science and creation are not at odds. Science points to creation Creation points to science. Science says it's life upon conception. The Bible says it's life always and even from eternity. That which God says is that which is. The Bible is the authority on every issue of life. I can't try to make it work. I can't contort it, twist it. That's what false religion does. It suits them. It's what Paul said to Timothy, for the time will come when they will no longer endure sound Doctrine, But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Got any YouTube favorite teachers that got really good platitudes? Time to get a clue. It might sound good. It might look good on Twitter. But is it an authentic picture of the Savior? They'll heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables, stories, motivational stories. Second mark, the devolving of God's son. I've already touched on that. When we dethrone God from his word, you're no longer the immoral authority on my life, God. It's an eventual leading to a devolving of God's son where Jesus Christ, again, is not considered God's son. Jesus Christ is not considered God in the flesh. Jesus Christ, to these false religions, is just a godly man, not God made man. They devolve Jesus. Islam, the entire religion 
Muslims say Jesus was a prophet. They've devolved God's son. Every single false religion takes Jesus and says he was not God. They also say he was not made flesh, which means he could not have come the way he did because the flesh is evil. That's what John's attacking here. So they go against the incarnation, God made flesh, and the atonement that God did not pay for our sins. You know what type of person would do that? If we painted a picture in your home, somebody came in and detonated a bomb, and you ran out of the kitchen, and to save everybody, you took your son and threw him on the grenade. What would they write about you in the paper? That's what false religions say God did when he created Jesus, his son, a scapegoat. But the Bible says God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Jesus said, me and my father are one. God took that blow. God jumped on that grenade. God died for me. He writes, then they went out from us because they were not of us. For had they been of us, this is an interesting usage of words, they would have continued with us. We talked about being in the world, but not of the world. John is using the same type of um, reference to explain those that were once with the church, but not of the church. They were in the church, but they did not prescribe or associate with the ways of the church. They were with us, but they were not of us. They went out from us that they might be made manifest, that they were never part of our family in the first place. What does that mean? It means it is possible to have earthly company, the same earthly company, but different heavenly births. It is possible to be in church and never come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He says they were with us, they were not of us, yet they went out that they'd be exposed that's why it is the church's holy responsibility to keep herself pure. Jesus made us pure, but then there's scripture verses that say our responsibility as a church is to be pure, to be holy, to make sure that we're pursuing holiness. This is not a work-based effort of holiness. This is God says I'm holy, therefore if I truly believe that, then my attitude and my life will pursue that. Here's the ultimate deception. It's how those in the church profess Christ, but do not truly possess Christ. P profess him with the mouth, but never truly possess him in the heart. Now, I'm not talking about not making mistakes when I say holiness. A true Christian, a holy church, knows that failures are not fatal that we will make mistakes, that we will imperfectly execute the commandments of God, that we will stumble and we will fall, that we will come out of character from time to time, that we will have lapses of judgment, lapses of selfishness, that we will go against what God says, we will honor our flesh, we will consume that which we want when we see it with the eyes. However, by and large, the Holy Spirit within us will keep convicting us and keep nudging us and keep prompting us. And he'll speak through a brother or sister. He'll call us back to himself. He won't give up on us and we'll come to a point of brokenness and we'll go through James chapter four, verses seven through 10 all over again, which says, submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And then rarely quoted verses, hey, wash your hands. Sinners, cleanse your mind. Come back to the renewal of God's word. Humble yourself in the sight of God, and he will be the one that lifts you up. How many profess Christ but don't possess Christ? 2 Corinthians 7.1, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, perfecting, saturating myself in holiness, being mature in holiness out of what? The fear of God. 
out of the all of God, out of longing for God, out of waiting for Jesus to return, being expectant in my lifestyle, a sense of urgency, knowing that he could show up any second. If he walked into my bedroom when I was alone, what would he find me doing? What would Jesus find me doing when nobody else is watching? That's what these verses mean. Does not mean you sleep with one eye open. Does not mean you constantly are waiting, looking up into the sky. That's very weird. Don't do that. Talks about a lifestyle, eagerly waiting, Paul writes. Why? Because you're a citizen of heaven. You're not there yet, but you're from there. You conduct yourself from there. You speak the same accent from there. And the only way to have the accent of heaven is to spend time in heaven's word. Knowing the scripture so well, that I can identify and discern a counterfeit, that I don't get weirded out when I hear antichrist, that there's a real spirit that is permeating throughout the world that is deceiving people, not non-believers, people that think they're close to God and they're not. That's the deception of religion. You say, that guy's really passionate up there. Shouldn't we all be? Shouldn't we all be about the things of God? Shouldn't we be enthusiastic about our faith? Shouldn't we come out of the closet of Christianity and begin to profess because I possess? And because I possess, I understand Hebrews 12, 14 says, I'm to pursue peace with all people. I'm not out to start a fight, but I'm also to pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I love the combination of peace and holiness, peace with God, peace with with God and from God, and then holiness, which is a lifestyle of pursuing Jesus. No, I, no matter what I do, no matter the mistakes I make, I get back up and I go right after the Holy One of God. Psalm 119, verse 9, question, how does a young man cleanse his way? Take heed, according to the word. It all goes back to the word. First mark, we dethrone God from his word, which leads to the devolving of God's son, Third mark of a false teacher and a false religion, the defaming of God's holiness. Why? Because if we're no longer using God's word as the standard, then anything goes. And the anthem is truly this, come as you are. And under the banner of God loves all, come in. But that's only half of the narrative. God loves all. God's love is inclusive. The cross exclaims that. But God's love is also exclusive which means you come as you are, but you don't dare ever leave the same as you came. Because when God finds you where you are, he doesn't leave you where you are. He takes you from the mud, cleans you up, slaps his name on you, and then he sets you out to be an example or a light in a dark world. And those that knew you from your past see who you are today and say there's a difference. And what we see is there's no difference in America with Christians and non-Christians. How far off have we fallen that recently a public library in Iowa lauded having drag queens come in and perform for the kids? Pictures of little kids with dollar bills and Jesus Christ in the public square is offensive. Telling people that in their sin, they're going to a place called hell forever is offensive. Yet the solution and the mercy of God who loves you in spite of you is Jesus Christ. But don't say that name. In fact, the non-believer is more blatant with the name of Jesus Christ, using it as a curse word than most believers I know using that word as a blessing. Madonna recently said that Jesus would be in support of abortion. the author of life. And people applauded that. Right? Freedom of speech. Don't force your religion on me. As they spend the very currency that says, in God we trust. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Yeah. 
But you, verse 20, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Please allow me to take this word anointing back and put it in the proper biblical context because this word has been wrung out in the wrong circles, used for the wrong reasons. When you hear the word anointing, here's what the Bible says about anointing. If you claim Christ as your Lord and Savior and he gives you his Holy Spirit, you are anointed. You are anointed by the Holy One, the Holy God, and you have the Holy Spirit. We take this word anointed and in certain religious circles say, oh, she's anointed or he's anointed, which ex expresses that you're holier than somebody else because you have a certain gifting. This word anointed by Jesus's definition is this. I pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. There it is. Every believer is anointed with the Holy Spirit. Every believer has the same amount of Holy Spirit. God does not come over your head and go, I'm just going to give you a a little bit of my Holy Spirit, but when you keep performing circus holiness acts, I'll give you more of myself. Oh, no, he doesn't. He gives us all of himself once and for all. The difference is this. Spiritual maturity is not measured by you getting more of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual maturity is measured by the Holy Spirit getting more of you. There's these frenzies and obsession weirdly with the Holy Spirit and the gifts. And I got to get more. You've been slain in the Holy Spirit yet? No, show me that in the Bible. Because the only time anybody's ever slain in the Bible is demon possession. The only time anybody's fallen out, the devil had something to do with it. Show me that in the Bible. Got to know the word. Got to read the word. Got to... Spend time in the word of God so you don't get caught up in these false religious movements. Holy Spirit was given to all. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So I give more of myself over to him. It's not the other way around. It's not, I'm not pursuing more of the Holy Spirit. I give more of me to the Holy Spirit. That's what keeps me from walking in the, in the Spirit is because I'm walking in my flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. Those are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. There it is. The anointing from God is the Holy Spirit given to all believers. Holy Spirit lives within you. The more you give access to God in your life, the more you're able to allow the Spirit to govern and dictate your steps. This is what John meant when he said, you will know all things. Not all things, like I have all knowledge. He's saying you'll have knowledge by intuition, not knowledge by experience. When the Holy Spirit lives within you, you have discernment. That's the word, discernment. I know all things. I can sense the difference between good and evil. That didn't sound right. That didn't look right. Yeah, that movement, that frenzy, that obsession, yeah, that don't sit well in my Holy Spirit. No doubt. Slow down, pastor. You're going a little hard on spiritual gifts. No, no, I'm going a little hard on God's word, reading God's word. Word, verse, chapter. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, that the helper, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, who will come from the Father in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And if you don't have any word in your heart, the Holy Spirit has nothing to work with. So would to God, right, that we would begin to give him more of ourselves, that we would submit a little bit more today than we did yesterday, that I would learn a little bit more about his character on a Thursday night that I knew last Thursday night, that I would surrender even deeper in worship tonight than I did last week that I would actually have my own relationship with God, that I would move out of the deception of religion and the traditions of man, that I would no longer rely on the things that the enemy is dangling over my head as forms of deception. And I would say, God, I don't want none of that. This world has nothing for me. I want to put your cross in front of me.
well, to God, right? No, but we don't. Of course we don't. We come into church. We find our same seat. We sit in our comfortable chairs. We say amen. We take our notes, and we run amok, and we leave, and we have every excuse in the world, justification of every type of sin. Where's brokenness at? Where's surrender at? When are people going to get on their knees and worship a good God? When are people going to raise their hands? Tired of hearing the narrative from men. It's not my disposition, man. It's not my personality. Oh, yeah? I love to see that, the day that you stand right next to Jesus. The Bible tells me in Revelation, because I read it, you don't have an option. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue is going to be singing a song Holy, holy, holy. Don't you dare force me to worship like that. Since we're not dead, we're not done. I preach this way because I believe this. I am not perfect at this. But I believe the church needs to wake up. I believe the time is now, as John said, it is the last hour. And it's often too late for us to consider the things of eternity. It's often too late because it's often back in that house of mourning. The loss of a child, the loss of a friend, the loss of a neighbor, the loss of a coworker. And then I begin thinking about the things of God. And I snap right back into the ways of the world. It's that quick. We need a church and a body that keeps each other accountable. That we don't ever come in and be comfortable. That we go deeper. That we look each other in the eyes and say, how you doing? How you doing truthfully, brother? How's your marriage, man? And we're honest and transparent and we're open about our sins. We're open to confrontation when it's biblical, confront me if I'm wrong. That we would stop making excuses. That was the narrative of every single inmate. I say that generally. The reason they couldn't get on with life is always an excuse, always something happened, always a reason why. Parole board this, upbringing that, circumstances this. Not once did they ever want to take the finger and go, I did this. Not once. Imagine the believer say, I did this. I sinned. I'm going to surrender. I'm going to break my knee. We know what some of us are doing right now. We're saying, it's way past the time we usually end. That's what we're doing. Some of you are doing that. I got to go pick up my kids. You got a pastor or a preacher that says, yeah, well, What if you don't make it home with your kids tonight? Where do you stand with Christ? Who do you say that he is? You know him? Your good intentions, your good wishes, your best efforts on that day will not count for anything. I don't know who I'm talking to. As Pastor Matt says, maybe this is a group of bona fide believers, but I doubt it. I doubt it. I'm going to close in prayer. Worship team's going to come back. Prayer ministers are going to come up. Somebody needs to give their life to Christ. Somebody needs to leave the comfort zone. Somebody needs to make a decision tonight because tomorrow is not a guarantee. I don't know who you are. God knows. Father in heaven, you know who that person is that you're drawing out of their comfort, drawing them out of the deception of religion, inviting them into the devotion of relationship with your son, Jesus. Perhaps for the first time, Lord, your church would begin to explode with praise. Every song, every every voice in here would sing. No excuses. Lord, I know your word. You call us to surrender by raising our hands. And I know that's not an indication of where we're at in our hearts, but I could tell you this. 
Lord, I know at times when I do raise my hands, something happens in my heart. When I get on my knees, Lord God, I humble myself in your sight. Lord, that husbands and fathers would begin to dedicate and commit their families back to you. That hobbies that take most of their time, Lord, would be replaced with a devotion to what you've called them to do. Lord, that we would rise up in righteousness. It is the last hour. Give us a sense of urgency in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. As a church, we believe it's our responsibility to connect our community to Christ. So if you've enjoyed the message today, then we'd like to invite you to share it with your family and friends. We'll see you next week.